Well, it sounds like we are going to do a daring conversation at this very moment in front of this polite company on the two things that you are never supposed to talk about in front of polite company, religion and politics. <laughs> now, uh, if you have noticed, there is a presidential campaign going on. <laughs> and I am asked by everyone in the room what I make of that, and you're going to hear a little bit of my thoughts on that subject. Um, but I want to start with, I got my clicker going here. Here we go. This, this is a country that is profoundly, profoundly disturbed by the course of our national leadership and the way in which we govern ourselves. This is a chart that shows the trust the American people have in our government. And look at where that line goes from the time Dwight Eisenhower was president down to when Barack Obama is president today. So we are losing the confidence of the American people that what happens in Washington, what our government does, will be in the best interest of the American people. And not surprisingly, in the question that pollsters ask over and over again uh, when they look at our political climate, in general, do you think the country is moving in the right direction or is it on the wrong track? And this number, obviously the red number on top, are the people who say we're going in the wrong direction. The bottom line are people who think we're on the right track. And that is the longest sustained period of time in which pollsters have measured a dissatisfaction with the way in which the country is headed for over a decade. The one little blip there is 9-11, when there was a moment where we kind of rallied together. Now, it's not President Obama necessarily that they blame because throughout most of his presidency, he's hovered, as you can see, with about half the people of approving the job that he's doing and half disapproving. But his ability to kind of use that bully pulpit to address some of the dissatisfaction that exists in the country is impaired because of the polarization that exists in our society. Now, <clears throat> here you are. This is a chart that shows what people think of our two major political parties. And you can see the decline there in the number of people who identify as Democrats, that's the blue line, the number who identify as Republicans, the red line, and the rise in the yellow line of the people who self-identify as independents. So when they look to our two political parties, which in the past have been sources of stability and coherency in our politics, they're largely dissatisfied with them. And more are willing now to say we disaffiliate with the two major political parties. By the way, those numbers, particularly among our young people, 18 to 25 years old, they're even much more pronounced with them rejecting the establishment institutional politics that we've had in this country. Here's a chart that is, I call it the collapsing center chart. Uh, when, my, when I started work in the United States Senate for Daniel Patrick Moynihan, one of the great public intellectuals who served in the U.S. Senate. He used to say that the quintessential question of American politics is will the center hold? Will the center hold? Well, this chart starting up in 1982 at the top shows the number of Republicans in the House of Representatives in red, Democrats in blue, who used to routinely cross party lines in order to reach compromise, move legislation forward, and try to get some things done in the national interest. And you can see what's happened as you go all the way down to the bottom, 2012, we're down to about 13 members of the House now who are routinely crossing party lines, which means that one of the great institutions of the American uh, democracy, our House of Representatives, is stuck in this polarized gridlock and not able, frankly, often to get much done. Now, this one's got a lot of numbers on it. I'm not sure how well you can see these. But this maps out what people think of the major institutions in our political life and social life together as a country. And it shows the change over the last 20 years and the number of people who approve of those institutions and the number who disapprove. Now absorb some of that. First of all, you look on the numbers on the far left how few of these major institutions are being approved of by more than half of the American people. The military, small business, uh, the police, by the way, this is probably before Ferguson and before some things that have happened that may have changed that number too, but look how few of them are getting more than half the American people saying 
We approve of that institution in our life together as the American people. And I don't have to kind of tell you to look at the one next from the bottom, what they think of organized religion. With the exception of Congress, organized religion, the church, has lost confidence of the American people faster and more dramatically than any other institution save Congress itself, which has only, as you see, 8% of the American people saying that they approve of the, that performance. Uh, folks, this is a picture of a country that's really in despair. In despair of the quality of our national leadership, our politicians, those who we would seek to have us have lead us. And my question for my segment here is, where's the church going to be in this discussion? And how often do pastors and the church flee in the other direction in the face of this kind of crisis of people who are lacking confidence in the very things that need to hold us together in community. So I'd like to suggest now that rather than run away from this and avert our gaze from this very troubling portrait of what uh, the American democracy looks like, that we instead need to engage in the public square and use our voice more prophetically. And I've got six things that I want to suggest, and then I'd like to have you discuss them. First, I think to our clergy, and indeed to all of our lay speakers and others, we have got to use our voice from the pulpit to shed light on controversy. That is not easy to do, I know. Moynihan used to also say, people are entitled to their own opinions, but not to their own facts. And I think one thing that we need to do is to provide the kind of information fact-based so that people have a better understanding of what the problems are. The problem of poverty with children we just heard about. The problem that, we, that many of our immigrant communities face. Uh, the problem of income inequality. Uh, even the basic matters of how a country decides to go to war and when. But these are issues in which we've got to hear the church and leaders of the church spelling out for people what the real facts are so that they can then make more considered opinions. Second, I think we have to model a different kind of public discourse in our own work together. In our meetings, our conferences, our general conference that's coming, we have to show how people of good faith can be together and be in conversation even when they disagree and disagree in a loving and more gentle, kinder way. I think the most important reason to do that is we have got to give our children a better model of what it looks like to be in real dialogue as we talk about the serious issues that face the future of the country. Because it's the opposite of what they see on television and what they see happening in the current national campaign. Third, I think we have to recognize that we have got diversity of opinion within our own body. If you've got the book of resolutions in your church library shelf and see how thick it is, you see that our United Methodist Church has an opinion on just about any subject under the sun. Now the problem is I would hazard a guess that maybe as many as 40% of the people in our congregations across the connection sometimes disagree what it says in that book of resolutions. And we sometimes bury that and put it back on the shelf rather than confronting that reality and having the kind of conversations that we need to have as Methodists about where we do disagree with each other. And we've experimented with that, as you know, at our annual conference in the Circles of Grace, and that could be a model of how you have these kinds of conversations even when we know there are disagreements. Fourth, I think we've got to encourage people to participate in our political process. I'm not saying pastors need to go out and tell people how to vote, but they need to tell them to get out and do vote and make your position heard. There are too many people in the face of the disenchantment that they have with our political process that decide to opt out. And the more that people participate, the more they are part of this conversation, the more I think that we can deal with some of the despair that exists. Fifth, we have got to use our voice as church people to speak out against hate speech and vulgarity. 
And I, I do mean when a front-running candidate for the President of the United States of America describes his penis size in a national debate, that is something that should offend us all and we should say so. <clears throat> now, last, I think we have to be incessantly in prayer for our national leaders. and We have to have communities of faith that will lift them up. And when they try hard to do the right thing, we've got to give them praise. They don't get a lot of love. And they need to hear from people who respect what they are doing, even if they may not agree, that they appreciate the good faith efforts to bring us to something that more closely resembles a common good. And that would mean inviting people who are running for office to come to your congregations, of course doing it for all sides, opening to all. It would mean being in closer touch with those who we do elect to represent us, to let them know that people are in prayer for them and concerned and care about the work that they do. They hear too little of that. And in my experience in politics, I would say the vast majority of people I work with are people of strong conviction, good character, and good faith. They just are trapped right now in a system that doesn't let that good come out. And I'm saying that's what we need to do. We have to liberate them so their better angels can prevail. The last thing I'll say is a little plug for what we are doing at Wesley Seminary, because we don't want you to go into this conversation unarmed. We are establishing a new Center for Public Theology, which will be a place where resources and events, programming and course offerings will be available to you even those who are maybe in the extension ministry programs looking for better resources so that you can help guide your conversations together in the congregations and the ministries where you serve. I truly do believe that we need to make America great again. But that is not the slogan of one man. I think that's an ideal that the church needs to reach for and strive to. And I think together, we will make that happen. Thank you very, very much. Oh.